And, and yeah. actually, I've never had a great sense of smell since the age of eight. Thank you, <laughs> by the way. Siren's busy driving. Guess I'll make my move. Crazy feet on Robin. Today, we have Australia's answer to Annie Lebowitz, who has taken some of rock music's most iconic images. He is also the front man for the band's Tumbling Dice, the Black Belts. He's also a third damn Black Belt. I want to welcome Richard Crawley to the Voodoo Room. How are you, Richard? All right. Yeah. No. Oh, fucking awesome. <laughs> I've got a couple of photos. I don't know if they're going to come out. For instance, I got. Oh, yeah, beautiful. You know, yeah, I got, I got, so that's a Jagger. They're all different. They're just rough prints. There's yes. Muddy Waters. Oh, great. I don't know if you've seen Tina Turner. No, I haven't no. seen Tina Turner's one, no. Yeah, there she is halfway through River Deep Mountain High. What year um, was that, Richard? That was Festival Hall, yeah, 1975. What, oh, that was 75. With, with the Ike and Tina Turner review. Okay. But I like the shot. I like the shot because it's kind of, you know, my, you know, her life was a nightmare then, you know, with with him, you know, beating her up and stuff like that. So I sort of like this black area that yeah. kind of gives a... More of a she, shady contrast. Slight, slight foreboding as well yeah. as... I mean, she, I mean, there's the soul queen. I mean, if there was anyone, you know. That's I right. I mean, her and Nina Simone. You know, I mean, Aretha Franklin. I mean, that's free for me, you know. It's Absolutely. Like, and here's Mr. Rodney Stewart. Oh, yes, know, like, yes. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So, uh, anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. No. Oh, you're fucking recording this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. that's it. Don't Have worry. We started. We started. No, yeah, we started. No, no. That's okay. No. Well, I mean, what do we do? I mean, are you happy to sort of just chat along? All right. So, yeah. how did you get into becoming a photographer, Richard? We'll start from there. Wow. Well. <laughs> The real answer is I was having a pillow fight with my brother. <laughs> and, uh, well, no, it's not true. That's how I've got my first 35 mil camera, but that's later on. I got given, to answer your question, literally I still have it up there. There's a box brownie on that top shelf. I got given that when I was seven years old. You know, it's one of those ones where you, you hold it down, Hasselblad-like, you hold it down at your waist level and you look through it. And Oh, okay. And and you uh, are you familiar with a box brownie? Is? I, I I know what they look like. I'm not familiar with them, but I do know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's the most basic camera you can possibly buy. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's it's got everything. It's not even a focus. I mean, there's like no focus. There's no aperture control. There's no shutter speed control. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. Yeah. So you just have to rely on what's called the latitude. That's the sort of what the film will resolve. You've okay. only got one exposure, in fact. <laughs> yeah, it. right. Well, so how did so you? Up, hmm. How would you load the film into something like that? Oh, you just open the back and load it. It's okay. a roll on. It's, it uses six twenty film. Okay. And that's uh, six twenty is kind of this big size film. Uh, it's not like thirty five mil. It's 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 even bigger than two and a quarter square mm -hmm. in inches. And um, and two and a quarter square is the Hasselblad format, as you as you might know. And but anyhow, um, yeah, because because it's a big negative though, literally about that long, mm -hmm. you could make what's called contact prints, which were big enough to look at. So they'd actually you didn't have to enlarge the negative to make a print that was um, sort of viewable, even if it is only like you know three by two and a half inches or whatever, three and a half by two and a half. Uh, and that's why at the age of seven, I was able to teach myself how to. Uh, develop films and then make contact prints. Wow. So I'm completely self-taught as a yeah. photographer. I've never had a lesson in my life really. So um So you, you actually had access to a dark room at the age of seven? No, 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 I I, <laughs> I made one in my okay. mother's my parents um laundry and, and used to come out of it white faced, you know, it was, yeah, it was terribly right. dangerous. I mean there was no air at all. Yeah. And I'm breathing all these noxious chemicals. And when you talk about developing chemicals like in the in the nineteen fifties, so this yeah. is like late fifties I was doing this. Uh, I mean they were really not safe. There was I mean, no all there, there was no all, there was no occupational know. health and safety back then. 
Richard. Oh, there was none of that. No, <laughs> no it's just no. get in there and do it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, and suffer the consequences. And and yeah. actually, I've never had a great sense of smell since the age of eight. Thanks, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> downside there. But yeah, I did learn how to make. Yeah, I did learn how to make prints very early that's on. That's pretty impressive. In, that's really impressive. In, in, Things led and and just to finish that story about cameras, I mean, I literally so so I could almost get it. I'm, the box, <laughs> you want to get box brownie? Any it's just any boxy looking thing is up there. Yeah. But then you're looking like down and to see out. But then when I was about eleven or twelve, I was having a pillow fight with my brother on holidays my younger brother, and I fell over and fractured my arm quite badly and, and la di da And then, then my father, out of the goodness of his heart, lent me his, like, a couple of weeks later, knowing I quite liked cameras even then, you know, lent me his 35 mil Voiklander rangefinder camera, and, and that was a 35 mil camera where you just look through 35 millimeter where you, you know. And um, I looked through that and how can I put it? the earth shifted. <laughs> <laughs> that was literally like that. It was, holy fuck, look yeah. at this. Yeah. You know, and I suddenly realised what, you know, the power of what photojournalism was. Even then I kind of got it immediately. It's like, yeah, you can do shit with this. You know, it's because 35 mil is so, um, you know, it, it's so portable and so movable and so um, mm. sort of, you can move with it. It's not like, oh, you've got to look through, you know. It's like, ooh, click, you know, yeah. it's that. Yeah. And that, you and, know, and, so I've always been a street street photographer. Just turn this yeah. fan off. You know, I've always been a street photographer, Yeah. not a studio photographer. And that kind of, that, that established that that was the way I was going to go. I wasn't going to be a... Because you have to remember then, you know, even when I started, when I was 20, so we're talking, you know, well, 1971, I was 20, right? So, I mean, the thing is, even then, uh, and in fact, when I came to Australia, I got here in 1973, and even then, you know, in Australia, most photographers were either studio photographers or they were, you know, architectural or photographers or they were commercial photographers, and there was a little bit of press, but there wasn't much. It was all very formulaic. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, I was ahead of the game even when I arrived then, you know, having come from England and absorbed a lot of the, you know, there was a lot of exciting photography in England then, you know, and, and in Europe, not just England. Yeah. I kind of got a handle on this. and Yeah, okay. well, whatever. Yeah, you know, okay. it sort of it was a progression. Sure. So but I've always were- learned from looking at other people's photography. That's been my inspiration, you know, looking at the masters, the great people, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, uh, you you actually when was this in London? It, you were you actually were yeah. living with your family? Yeah, I come from north of London actually, okay. about twenty miles okay. north of London. Which in the sixties was only half an hour, forty five minutes. I used to say it was forty five minutes to the West End. Yeah, right. And Ronnie Scotts, and more <laughs> importantly, the Marquee, the Marquee yeah, Club okay. in Wardour Street in Soho, where all the bands were playing. Yeah, right. You know, like the Who or yeah, the yeah. Kinks or the yeah. Stones or yeah. I mean, every Rod Stewart, the Face, yeah. everyone played. Yeah, played there. You know, it was like awesome. It, it was that was forty five minutes with the roof down. Wow. That's- <laughs> <laughs> now it'd take you about four hours. You wow. know, with the traffic. <laughs> so, wow. Anyhow. Okay, so so I guess you've been asked a lot of these questions over the years, but could you run through the method you took to fake your ticket to see the Rolling Stones in 1973? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean that, that, yeah, that is, is a, and, and the photo that I, I did grab a couple out of the, uh, just went, no, oh, I've got an odd print. And, and so I, the, the photo that you're actually referring yes. to, this is a very small print. Can you see that? Yep. That, that's, that's the one that resulted, the, which became pretty well known to be honest. In okay. fact, Probably, well, it is the most iconic live shot of the man ever taken, and and that was sheer luck. But that's the way yeah. it was. But how I how I came to take that photograph was interesting, because I'd only been in this country three weeks, and I'd come out on the boat. Yeah. I'd left with a hundred pounds sterling, uh, and then arrived with nothing because I drank the whole lot on the boat. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, what do you do? Twenty one. Yeah. <laughs> 
or whatever it was. Yeah, I was 21. And uh, so, um, yeah, I wrote nothing. I have a job to go to with Oxford University Press, as in pub- book publishing. This was three weeks after I'd arrived. And obviously, you're paid monthly. Your internet connection is unstable, as just said. Oh, well, hopefully not. Anyhow, um, <laughs> there we go. So I started uh, playing a coup problem here. Ticket was $5. I hadn't got any money. I hadn't mm. got five bucks. Yeah. I got nothing. So I actually faked a press pass, which said Blue Meanie Press. Now, that is quite 70s. <laughs> and, and I got in. And then I got down the front in the end, which took a lot of doing, sort of evading the levels of security at Kuyong to get into the bottom tier, you know. And, that. and then I got 10 foot from the stage, and the stage is only about six foot, five foot, four foot, whatever. It wasn't very tall, unlike today when they're about 30 feet up yeah. in the air or something. And anyhow, like, yeah, so what happened then was, oh, shit, I shot 10 real click, I've run out of film. I did have 50 cents, so I sort of waved this in front of another photographer, and he gave me a roll of film. And then the Stones went into, into Midnight Rambler, and Jagger sort of whipping the stage, screaming, you know, do you hear about the Midnight Bang? You know, do you hear about the Midnight Rambler Bang? And then he dropped down on his knees, right, and then just went, you know, and at that moment the crowd went like this, you know, because, you know, and I just went click. And it was number 36 on the reel, which for you uh, – non-analog people out there means that it was the last shot on the reel and mm. i mean you know what a bit of luck that was oh, totally. and it's funny you know sometimes you know you know when you take a photo you kind of know that you have a blinder and i you know when i took that i knew i did i mean often you don't you know you go in the dark room and you muck around and you do this and, you, and then whoa yeah that's pretty good but i mean in this case so i went home and i worked all night in the dark room, and then I, the next morning I went and saw Molly Meldrum, who had a magazine then called Go Set, before he went on telly with Countdown. And, um, uh, yeah, and flogged it to him for, uh, you know, for the front page uh, of Go Set, the next, the next issue. And I even remember the headline of it. It said, The Greatest Show on Earth. And it was an amazing show. It, it was an incredible show. And uh, But, yeah, that started the rock photography with me. So I did a lot of stuff in the in in the 70s really yeah um, i mean that's yeah. quite a story um so <laughs> so 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 yeah so, a bit of luck <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so so around that time and from the early 70s you mm-hmm. became a very prolific uh, photographer taking photos of some of the great rock well, and roll artists yes, such no. as i mean I, I yeah i did in in sort of a few and i got a couple of others here i mean from that era so i mean i got to the point where i was so well known by the bouncers at festival hall they just let me in yeah you know, I, I gave up sort of Faking bothering cards. to get yeah. press passes. Yeah. <laughs> they just let me in, <laughs> yeah. you know, because I was there. Though. I mean, and there's the Muddy Waters. That's Muddy Waters, yeah. for that's, instance. That's um, amazing. Can you see? Yeah. yeah. And there's a nice story with that one because he wasn't well. I actually met him and shook hands with him backstage okay. at Festival Hall that night, and that was pretty awesome. I mean, that was a big highlight. Hello, hello. I have muddy waters. Yeah. Don't believe I'm shaking hands with you. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, it's like he's a really nice guy. And yeah. then, you know, and he said, I'm not actually not feeling very well, you know. Um, I'm not feeling great at the moment. I've got a bit of flu or something. I uh, said, so I'm going to sit down. Uh, so I said, well, that's fine, but do you mind if I, you know, take a few shots up the front and all that? He said, mm, you know, because I like getting in a little bit close and around the sides. And, and he said, no, nah, it's fine. So, so he played this mind-blowing show, you know, just sort of like, oh, my God, you know. The, and what blew me out, actually, about that show was that how good his voice is. I mean, you know, he's an incredible band leader, guitar player and everything, but Christ, as a singer, he's really good too. And, and uh, well, anyhow, like, like, it all went really well, and then, but he's sitting down, and then suddenly he stands up and does this dance, and but I'm, I was changing films. <laughs> You know, so I missed it. Yeah. Oh, God, I missed the shot. And I thought, oh, he's got another show tomorrow night. So I went back and I just waited. <laughs> Guess what? He did it again. Yeah. You know, he stood up for 30 and I got the shot. And I like this because he's looking right at the camera. He's like, he saw me and he's just looking straight at me. He's like, hello, man. Yeah, that's it. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, that really was fun. And actually the other festival hall shot I've got here, which is the same era, which was 1975, was Tina Turner um, 
you know, the queen, the queen yeah. of rock and roll as far as I'm concerned. You yeah, know, it's totally. Just, and there she is blazing away pretty much through um, River Deep Mountain High. And that, that, that was that was special, that show. I mean, you know, I mean, and I like the shot because none of, it, you know, this wasn't Tina Turner as such. It was the I Can Tina Turner Review, as mm-hmm. it was called then. Yeah. And, and as you know, Pete, you know, like her life was a nightmare then because of Ike Turner was a... Mm. Controlling uh, freak. A few things, couldn't yeah. I? You know, but he wasn't a nice person and um, he used to beat her up. And so I quite like the way this shot sort of, even though it's quite soulful, you've got this big black area that's slightly, for me anyhow, you know, everyone has their own. It's slightly, so anyhow, whatever. Actually, no one's really ever seen that shot before. <laughs> I haven't really done anything with it. But there we go. I mean, you, you would have had rolls of camera so you you would have multiple shots of different shots, would that be right? Of, like you've got you've, oh yeah you yeah most of these shows like yeah. you know I'd shoot ten reels or something yeah yeah so, so you, and, you um, you've got a backlog of photos that you haven't disclosed to the public is that right or is it stuff that you've probably just been, yeah yeah and no one's seen the Tina shot yeah. actually yeah um, or hardly yeah, yeah I mean for instance yeah I mean look I've yeah, I mean, some are, you know, the Jagger, you know, some are reasonably va- the, the, valuable in the sense I have a limited edition of the Jagger shot, richardcrawleystore.com. Yes. For all you folks out there, there's the plug. <laughs> yeah. um, but, I mean, yeah, and that includes also, I mean, you know, I mean, here's one of, of Rodney Stewart when he really was a rocker. You yeah. know, I actually like, this is only a rough print, so you can probably see marks on it, but it's, I love this shot because it's, it's a real rock god shot for it me. Is. <laughs> he was. I mean, this is when he was a shit kicking rock star. Yeah. You know, like you know, with the faces. So we're talking 1974 live in the South Melbourne Cricket Ground. You know, with with Ron Wood on guitar and the faces. You know, who were a really great rock band. Yeah, I mean, totally. you know, I mean, you've got to remember at that point they just put out. What did they just? They just put out "Stay with Me" about a year and a half before. I mean, stay with me. I think any, everyone would agree it's probably as good as anything the Rolling Stones ever did. Probably, uh, you know, in, from the point of view of, of a shit kicking rock song. And 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 he was. I mean, an interesting thing was within two years of this shot, you know, he's met Brit Eklund and sort of gone soft cock. To be quite honest, <laughs> that's sort of the my view. He went middle of the road. I mean, look, Atlantic Crossing and albums like that were hugely successful but he did go mor you know i think yeah. you know and became less of a rock rock and roller oh, well, he did some great stuff in the late 70s i mean um hot legs mm. and do you think i'm sexy i mean that, that were pretty good mm. they, uh, not your, no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i'm more gasoline alley and every okay. picture tells the story don't okay. it i mean those albums you know yeah because in the early 70s he had he used to put out his own solo albums, you know, remember that, Pete, as well as, as, well as stuff with the faces. He was so well off, do you know, this? Not, I don't know if you know, he, he made so much money in the early 70s. I mean, no wonder it might have turned his head slightly. I mean, do you know, he actually had two Lamborghini Muras at one point. Jesus Christ. I mean, those cars are now worth something like three million each. I could have. That's <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, sure. Yeah, two of the... Two of them. <laughs> Do you think he's still got them? I wonder if he's still got them. Oh, I don't think he's got them still, no. no, no. Actually, Keith Richards' GTS Ferrari was just, oh, I'll muck around with old cars a bit yeah. so I know this crap. Not that yeah. I've got a Lamborghini, but, yeah. So anyhow, like, um, whatever. But you have, an old, you, you, you have an old Porsche, don't you? I don't. You shouldn't say this. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> Cut. No, it's an old GT. It's a GT4 Ferrari. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's Dino. right. Dino. But that's yeah, the yeah. only vaguely yeah. affordable Ferrari there is, yeah. and I've had it 20 years. Yeah, yeah. It was actually, it cost the same as a land, second-hand Land Cruiser when I bought it. It was okay. either a second-hand Land Cruiser or a Ferrari. So I thought, and actually there was a serious reason. My brother had just died. Yeah. My brother drowned in New Zealand, and I had to do something insane. Yes. Yeah, I sort of did. So I did. So you did. Yeah, anyhow. Ha, ha, did, I just want to ask a question. Um, did Mick Jagger end up with the photo that you took, considering uh, that mm. the st- at that stage the Stones were at their highest 
of success. Yeah, they and, were. They were the biggest band. You're absolutely right. Yeah. 1973, they were the biggest band in the world. Yeah. No question. And so for uh, you to make contact with them and, not, and let him know that you had the photo, how did that transpire? Uh, not at that stage, okay. no. Although it was probably – well, I personally didn't, but the photo sort of leaked out a bit, you know. I mean, it was in Go Set and then it was in newspapers a little bit okay. illegally, I say. But anyhow, it was. And then without my permission is what I meant. Yeah, because I own copyright. Yeah, but anyhow, that happened, and so I know he was aware. And then when he was out here in the eighties, um, I actually got him to sign. I've got a big signed one on the wall. Yeah, in which I know you've seen. Yeah, you know, like in that other room. But anyhow, he he, um, yeah. So I got him to sign. That's when yeah. These are these. It, there were three signed, three big ones. Okay, he kept one. I kept one, and the third one we decided to give to the Royal Children's Hospital Appeal. Beautiful. But, you know, there, was it Channel 9, whatever it is? You know, yeah. yeah. Although I will say, it went for a lot of money, although I actually, <laughs> I'll be absolutely honest, the, I think probably what made that first prize, the, the sort of first thing was my photo and something else, but the something else really was valuable, and that was a, a, a strap signed by Eric Clapton. Wow, <laughs> wow. So, Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful yeah, guitar, person. but anyhow, yeah, no, it was a good thing to do. So, but, um, oh well, that's how. So, so, how, so, was that during Rod um, Mick Jagger's solo? Concert yeah, it was. It was when yeah. he was having one of his famous spats with Keith Richards, yeah. and they. What was the name of that first album? It was She's the Boss or something. Yeah. He put that yeah. out. It must have been about eighty-eight. I never saw him play, but he played at the Corner Hotel, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that concert at the. Well, you uh, went to that, did you? I went you? to that concert. Yeah, not to the one in the corner. I went to the one at the uh, tennis center. Oh yeah, at, so there must have been a warm up. The, the one at the, yeah, and at, uh, and Joe Satriani played guitar for him at that stage. Oh, that's right. And um, yeah, I was on Pretty the good side. Band. Oh, oh, incredible band! And I was on the <laughs> I was on the side of the the stage type of thing, looking down straight at the stage and. I saw Mick come through because they had all these sort of curtains at every five metre interval sort of things up up until the he gets to the band stage sort of thing. And yeah. uh, there was this light wind coming through and then Mick just comes on. They start playing. They do about 16 bars and he comes in with a radio <laughs> mic, comes through and and you could just sense his aura and I just thought, no, what this – there's no other band or no other person that I've seen with mm. that type of aura on stage. I mean, he charisma, right? Charisma, yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah, incredible. Well, he, he, look, you know, and what goes around comes around. Here I am with a band doing, as you know, one of the bands I got doing Rolling Stones material, yeah. And uh, but it, hopefully in an authentic way. But you know, like for me, he's a, he, he, you know, God, you can learn stuff from that guy. Oh yeah. I mean, he's an amazing role role model. Like him or hate him, he's 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 a consummate performer. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah, you totally. Know, one of the greatest. Yeah. Although, you know what he says? You know, I was like that, you know, and I've, I sort of hold this photo up again, you know. You know what he <laughs> says? He says, in, I've heard Jagger say this. He says, well, you know, yeah, I'm good at dancing, but honestly, I'll style all my moves off Tina. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he did. He did, yeah. She was the one that started it. She was the ultimate raunchy yeah. dancer to start with and he just nicked it all. But he's good. He's really good. Yeah, I've, I've just is. discovered a, another female uh, singer from the 70s, Betty Davis. Do you know who she was? Um, I, yeah, I'm not very familiar with her Oh, stuff, man, you, you, yeah. you'll have to listen to her because uh, I've just come across her. She's still alive. Betty Davis. Betty, da- Betty Davis. Got- and she was really raunchy. She was, and she was married to Miles Davis uh, for a little while. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, you I should. I saw him live. I saw Miles Davis live in the late eighties in Melbourne, and that was a highlight. I could imagine. Bloody hell, it was. Anyhow, I'll, I'll remember. Yeah. So I've been. I, I, I had a look at your, some of your photos because you obviously uh, had a. You lived in uh, St Kilda for a little while, mm. and you took some iconic. St Kilda shots with your camera and especially the one with uh, the twins in the uh, at Scheherazade's is that correct? Right, Ackland Street. Yeah, Ackland yeah Street, well yeah. I mean I was living there then and you know like I I, I sort of oh, I've always photographed where I that's the other thing I do besides the rock stuff I, it, I I've always enjoyed photographing communities and you've got to remember here I am like pretty green come out of England Sunny in this crazy place called Australia. 
living in St Kilda, and St Kilda was off the wall in the early 70s. Mm. I mean, I remember even then realising that, and this is true, that well, pretty much that it was e- if you walked down Fitzroy Street, it was honestly easier um, to buy an ounce of grass or get, lead, or get laid than it was to buy a litre of milk. I mean, you know, it was, it was, <laughs> it was just like nuts. And so, you know, from a photographic point of view, it was really easy to get come shot. up with some interesting yeah. stuff. You know, and I, I was in this crazy shared household with my girlfriend then in, in, in St Kilda. Actually, Carol Jerems was also in St Kilda, and I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but she's arguably, one of her shots has just been sold for, it's the most expensive Australian photo ever sold. I mean, wow. it's incredible. But she was, yeah, it's a very famous photo of her, uh, well, anyhow, yeah. Carol Jerems. I never knew her then, but we're funny enough, we were both kind of, photographing St Kilda at the same time yeah, but right. she didn't really do it like I did I kind of did the streets mm-hmm. I, I, I was the street guy I was like got in the nitty gritty yeah. you know and, and and that included the shot you just talked about the one in um, in uh, in Sh- Ackland Street yeah. that was part of an exhibition I mean it's an absolute joke my first exhibition I ever had and I'm not boasting it's just true it was a one man show at the National Gallery of Victoria in 1975 and it was about those St Kilda you know I took 10,000 negatives in St Kilda and I sort of managed to get a few good a few decent shots out of it and and that became the show and uh no, I've never had one <laughs> I've never had a show there since but anyhow you know in fact it's been all downhill ever since <laughs> But I mean, yeah. But, but that, uh, but that, I, mean, but that, I mean, yeah, that's only partially true. I mean, of course, I have exhibited in other places, but it was a good place to start, and certainly, it was a very good learning curve. Um, you know, if you can photograph, you know, people who are off their heads, you know, and sometimes you can be in a dodgy situation. You know, if there's alcohol, or, it's alcohol. It's not so much drugs. It's, it's, if people have, are alcohol, you know kind of violent you've yeah. got to be careful and sometimes i had to be quite careful yeah um yeah because i would just walk up to people and say you know do you mind if i take your photograph yeah. and then either it'd be quite obliging or they'd, or they'd just tell you to fuck off yeah you know it's just it was sort of it was one or the other always you know and generally generally that you know they the former people didn't mind but yeah on occasions you had to yeah so that was that was a that, that, I learned a lot from that. Yeah. yeah. Because that yeah. particular photo could have been taken, if you look at that photo, it could be placed anywhere in the world. I mean, it, it, there's no, you know what I mean? It's that international of the two girls in the coffee shop. It just yeah, seems, well, it's, it, yeah, well, thanks. It's, you know, it's a kind thing to say. I think, you know, of all the, you know, I've obviously been influenced by an awful lot of brilliant photographers, you know, people, well, I mean, um, you know, obviously, I mentioned Annie Libovitz yeah. from, um, uh, you know, who in, in, you know, with the rock and roll stuff. We were yeah. doing stuff at the same time, and, and she obviously went on to very, very great things after that. But there were um, Diane Arbus, for instance, was a very influential photographer for me. She, but she specialised in photographing freaks, and it actually did her in. She kind of topped herself in the wow. end. She couldn't. She kind of, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Mm. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, but um, the thing is, um, I kind of have never wanted to photograph freaks. I've kind of, and that's why one of my books is called The State of Common Life, meaning everyday life, which was about the Western District of Victoria, yeah. for instance. You know, I've always tried to photograph um, life as it is rather than looking for necessarily the fringes. Yeah. But the thing about the St Kilda stuff is everything was on the fringe when you were there, so <laughs> yeah. it didn't really matter, you know. It's kind of like it was all there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I said again, I mean, the, you know, the photography. It's interesting with photography too, though, because, you know, it's kind of like what's happened with me is, especially since my wife died, you know, I've kind of wanted to, change things completely and not sort of um, be behind the camera. In fact, I want to be in front of it. Front of it. <laughs> that's yeah, that's happened. right. And you've got your two bands, uh, the Black Bouts and the Tumbling Dice Band. 
Yeah, well, the Black Belts yeah. is a four-piece high-octane rhythm and blues band that, you know, it, it, around here. And, uh, I mean, we'd love to play the Dogs Bar in St Kilda. I mean, we absolutely could come out to St Kilda and play. I mean, it's, yeah. the band is a really good band. I mean, we're basically playing pub rock in its... Uh, pub rock in its original sense, which means the Dr. Feelgood sense, mm. that that sort of sound, yeah. um, which was the early 70s. They were a really influential band. They weren't really, really very well known out here, but in the UK, you've got to remember in the early 70s, it was all pretty limp-wristed. I mean, you know, you had, what, Mark Bolan and, I mean, he was pretty good, but, I mean, I photographed him too, actually. But, I mean, you know, like T-Rex and you had... I don't know, Yes and bands like that, yeah. you know, Prog Rock and mm. ABBA or something. But there wasn't much. Even the Stones had gone off the boil a bit by the sort of 1974 for a bit, you know. And so there wasn't much around. And then Dr. Feelgood came along and started playing pubs with this really up-tempo R&B and people said, whoa, look at this. Yeah. And you got people like Joe Strummer and Johnny Rotten and God knows who else used to go and see the feel goods and say, and I swear they would have said, oh, I mean, they love them. Mm. And I almost reckon they would say, oh, well, look, why don't we, you know, let's, let's do this. We'll just play three chords, mate. Yeah. And that's how punk rock, I mean, honestly, I don't think punk rock would really have, well, of course, Iggy Pop, you know, is as much to do with punk rock as anyone. But then again, you know, without Dr. Feelgood, I don't think it would have started in England, but, you know, that huge change. Yeah that happened in the mid-70s without them. So that's why they're such an interesting band. I've only seen footage of uh, Dr. Feelgood, but what strikes me is the guitar player who keeps walking up and down the stage. And it's like a, mili- <laughs> it's like right. a, it's like a military right. sort of stance, you know. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and then the bass yeah, player no, does well, it. And they're out, and they're <laughs> yeah, out, they did. You know, they're out of sync. Yeah. You know, they're not doing it together. Wilco, One, Wilco Johnson. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, he was, a, you know, he was unbelievable. That's right, him and the bass player used yeah, to walk, walk up. up and and actually the bass player always used to have trouble keeping up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because he was off. They were all, and that's why the band broke up. I mean, these things happen. I mean, because you had three alcoholics basically in the band and then Wilco, who was a speed freak. Well, you know. That's a recipe for a total yeah, disaster. disaster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm not really laughing because they did break up. But, I mean, yeah. yeah, he, he and Wilco was unbelievable, though. I mean, he was a really interesting guitarist. And, you know, like, do you know their first album, he insisted that it be released. This is 1974. He, ref- he, he And there was a sense to this. They're a four-piece, right? And he liked basically live in the studio. And he said, look, I want it released in mono. Yeah. I don't want stereo. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, look, we don't want them, especially in the early 70s where you often put the drum kit coming out the left and the bass yeah. out the right. It was, you know, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. It was really yeah. separated out, right? And he said, no, that's ridiculous. You know, yeah. we want it all out of each side. Yeah. And so you had this massive argument. with the, But anyhow, and then, it, then it came out. And, uh, and I've got a great qu- quote written on the studio wall here. I really like it, you know, seeing me, you know. <laughs> it's like, what is it? Yeah, that's it. Overdubs are for pansies. <laughs> it's really get, it, good. get it right. Get I mean, it right it's the just, first time. You know, you just really like playing live, yeah. and I, which I do too, actually. Yeah. I mean, all our recordings are live. Yeah. And and I know Maybe because uh, you're the most else, but, you're, you're you're a pretty energetic type of guy on stage because I I've never seen anyone do push ups on stage before. <laughs> well, you know, oh, third Dan black belt. That's why we call the black belt. That's so right. third Dan in taekwondo. That, but the it isn't only because the original guitarist. I mean, Dave's the most gentle guy. Dave Gibbs was the most gentle guy you'd ever meet. But he was actually a cage fighter. Yeah. You know, UFC. I mean, you. You wouldn't want to tangle with Dave, but yeah. I mean, you know, we were the black belts, so we never had any security issues. <laughs> 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 that was the plus, yeah. Well, you're very but, energetic. Yeah. You're very energetic, and you've got a lot of charisma on stage when you perform. Well, it's such fun. Yeah. You know, it's the funnest thing. Well, almost the funnest thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, it's an old cliche to say it, but it really is true because what you give out, you get back That's and then right. you give it out and it just goes round and round. And not that we're playing in front of huge crowds <laughs> in Port Ferry <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or um, Warnable. Yeah. But then again, we could, you know, honestly, we even the other band, Tumbling Dice, which is the rolling seven-piece Rolling Stones band, is authentically – a really good band, and we not. I don't like calling us a cover band as such. It's a celebration of the Stones' music. 
mm. really, from particularly looking at the 68 to 72 period, you know, when they, that was their amazing period when they put out, well, you'd know this, yeah. Beggar's Banquet, Let It Bleed, Stingy Fingers and Exile on Main Street, all in four years. Yeah. I mean, four unbelievable records. Yeah, I think Stingy. And, I, and, I, and Pete, I love that story with, yeah, have you heard this one? Like, you know, when I put out Beggar's Banquet, it's like, as today, you know, you'd put the single out. For, well, they put the single out first, right? Mm. And it came out three months. So the single comes out. Three months later, they put out Beggar's Banquet. But they yeah. sort of said, oh, sod it. We're not putting a single on the album. Sheer waste of vinyl. We've got all this other great stuff. You know, what, what, why would we do that? You know, so it never, the single never went on the album. And Beggar's Banquet, of course, is brilliant. It's got Sympathy for the Devil on it. It's got God knows what else. But you know what the single was? <laughs> Never on it. It was Jumping Jack Flash. I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's unheard of that mm. you would put a, that, you know, that, a single that of that caliber, caliber on your record yeah. these days. But that's, that's what interests me about the Stones, that they were really into their art in the same way the Beatles were, you mm. know, at that stage. Uh, you know, really it was a – well, everyone knows it. I mean, it's from almost a renaissance musically in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. There's a great book called 1971, by the way. Is it Roger Hollingsworth? It's about 1971 and he makes an argument about 71 as possibly being the greatest year in rock and roll ever, even though the Beatles had broken up by then. And he makes a pretty convincing case. I mean, the Stones actually recorded, no, they released Stingy Fingers in 71, didn't they? Oh, well, that, that's an unbelievable record. I mean, there was a lot so, of there was a lot of change just in society, you know, coming f from the mid '60s into the early '70s. Like culturally, mm. uh, it was mm. it was like a different. It was it was so vast the difference between conservative, a conservative Western world to more of a uh, liberal. It's really that's it, so so true, and it's so easy to forget that you know when you, um, you know, you've got to look at in the '60s. If you were playing rock and roll in England, and this is really not an exaggeration, if you were playing rock and roll in the 60s in England and even the early 70s, you were a delinquent as far yeah. as the general population was concerned. Like, you're fucked in the head. Yeah. yeah I mean, no, honestly, you're like off the planet. Yeah. You are a moron mm. because you're playing rock and roll. Now you can go to university and learn that's how to right. do it. I mean, it's like mainstream. <laughs> yeah, that's right? right. They've got courses, haven't that's they? Right. You know, it's like it's easy to forget that yeah. how subversive, you know, it was, you know, and how, you know, we've lost that edge now. And that's that sort of bothers me. But it is one of the reasons that I am very attracted to that era. Anyhow, yeah. coming back to the Stones from 68 yeah. to 72 when they were. And, of course, they had Mick Taylor, the amazing yeah. guitarist with them then, who was probably their, well, definitely their greatest lead guitarist ever. But he, he looked but, so out of place, though, with the Rolling Stones. He, he just didn't look like, like Ronnie Wood looks like a Rolling Stone. But, yeah, he's I mean, more of a larrikin. He, yeah. In fact, didn't he have a band called the Larrikins or something, I think, Ronnie Wood? Yeah. But he... he um, Do you know what I mean? Like it's sort Yeah, of, absolutely. You know, he's, he's much, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're right. Mick Taylor was a bit like Bill Wyman, yeah. a bit of a statue. Yeah, where he'd just stand right. there and but, but that, actually and of course Bill Wyman was an amazing bass player yeah. too. Oh, completely yeah. underrated. Yeah, totally. And uh yeah. But Mick Taylor, yeah, he was you know, um oh what's that like? What's the track called? You know, the end of Stingy Fingers, it just goes into this amazing Santana esque yes. jam. Yeah, that's you know what I hear you knocking. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 And um, you know, you know how that came about. The tape just—they just left the tape running, and yeah. well, none of that was scripted. It just happened. Yeah, that's it. Great. Yeah. It's, that's a great tune. And that part, that breakdown part that they jam out to, is incredible. Yeah, it's really it's, amazing. It's an and amazing. That, that just happened. Yeah. yeah. And the beginning of that song where Keith Richards hits those chords—that's the best intro yeah. to any rock and roll guitar intro. It's yeah. like the angry. And the interesting thing is, I never understood the Stones. They never do it that way live. The way they do it live, and they even by the seventies they were doing this. They were when they did that track live, it was almost done in a sort of um, a canter rather than a gallop. It was as I don't know why. <laughs> 
<laughs> tell you yeah. where to do it. We're going to do it like the original. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, whatever. That's right. But, um, yeah, but, I mean, you know, the Stones, I mean, you know, if you go online and look at their, uh, their early 70s stuff, like Live at the Marquee, I mean, it is amazing. Yeah. You know, yeah, whatever. But then again, there were an awful lot of great bands, as we all know then. But, yeah. Mm. I mean, what what a... I want to just get back to the photography just slightly, just to get your mm. opinion on, because um, it's a different world now as the digital age has overtaken the art of photography. Do you think something has been mm. lost through the transition? Yeah. Well, yeah, but, you know, change is as good as a holiday, but I've got all the digital gear up there, but, I, you know, I've never liked it. And it's really interesting, and I kind of realised why, and I'll tell you what it is. Like, with the... <sighs> With a digital camera, you sort of go click. Well, this is you basically you know you don't just go click. That's the point. You go, you hold your finger down, you take about twenty five frames, bang, 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 and then bang, 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 and before you know it, you've taken about three thousand or something, and then you go home and you basically take the photograph again because what you do is you look through all these photos and you say, oh no, that's no, 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 that's been, no. oh that's the one. So you've done it again. Now, there was a photographer called Henri Cartier-Bresson, very famous um, French. Um, he actually co-founded the Magnum um, photo journal, photojournalistic, um, uh, what's the right word, company, club, whatever it is, you know, the amazing organisation that's, that's a photojournalist. But he, he, ter- he, he coined the phrase the decisive moment. And, and there's this great story of him going to photograph, I think it was him, going to photograph President Kennedy in the early 60s where, you know, he, and, and like even then generally, you know, people would walk in with a couple of assistants and that. But these days, if Annie Livovitz, and she does this sort of thing these days, went to photograph Trump, God forbid, but say she did, she'd literally be there with an army. I mean, there'd be like about... 20 assistants, there'd be cameras, lights, there'd be everything, there'd be like this massive production. Okay, that's how you do it now. So go back to 1964 or three or two, whatever it was, and in, 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 in walks Cartier-Bresson, right, well, I think it was him, yeah, with his battered up Leica, one camera, like really beaten up. And, and, and he says, well, can I meet the president? So they, anyway, he went in. And he said to John Kenny, just, oh, let's just talk. Let's just have a chat. So they just sort of talked about things for about half an hour or 20 minutes or something. And then suddenly he says, hang on, Mr. President, just hold on. So he picks the camera out and goes, right, that's it. Yeah. Got my shot. See ya. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, I think he took a couple more, but you know what I mean? It's like the decisive moment. So that's what right. you do, this is the difference. You know, often if you take a photograph, you, in a sense, let the photograph take itself. Mm. You're just the medium between what that is and what the end result is. That's what yeah. a photographer is. So you're kind of, you wait. It's in, all intuition. I mean, after all, if you take a photograph at 125th of a second, why didn't you take it at another any one of the other 124ths mm. that are in that second. Now, don't tell me, don't tell me that's an academic decision. It's not. It's mm. a, an intuitive decision. Yeah. And that's what's been lost from, in my book, from, and of course there's brilliant photographers these days mm. doing amazing work. Yeah. But there is something also to be said about, I mean, black and white when yeah. you're, with film, when you're in the dark room, and it's just worth pointing this out, when you're doing a complicated print, and actually that muddy waters print, that's this is a print I've actually done in the dark room. Mm. Yeah. Now, when I made that print, it wasn't just enlarger, expose, show it in the developer. Oh no, there's heaps of what you call burning and dodging, and that means you're adding and subtracting light with your hands and bits of card and shit like that all over the place to balance it out to where you want it, and then you develop it. Mm. Now, when, you, when, when you're doing a complicated print like that, there's no way you can make two the same. Yeah. It's yeah. impossible. Yeah. Like they're all going to be slightly different. Yeah. Now, that in itself is interesting because 
you know, in Photoshop, if you're a digital shop, you know, you muck around and then you could print a million and they're all identical. So yeah. there's, there's something about the magic of the, it's actually the inexactness of yeah. the black and white process yeah. and the, the, the darkroom, the inexactness of the, the darkroom process that yeah. makes it, that's the magic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the difference. Yeah. I guess it's similar mm -hmm. to audio where analog against digital. Uh, analog. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well you mean tape, tape versus. Yeah. And I'd love tape hiss yeah. when I yeah, hear yeah, it in recordings. That's right. So. That's right. <laughs> but um, yeah, because once. I mean, it, I suppose that's not what you're meaning, though. What do no, you no, mean? I, I mean that sonically, uh, w when you record on to tape, there's even if you're distorting, you're going into the red. It, you don't hear the distortion. Yeah. You're hearing the tape, that's the oxide break up. So it's going into the ether type of thing. Oh, that's really interesting you say that. You yeah. know, that occurred to me just the other day when I was listening to um, James Brown's original 1961 recording of Lost Someone, mm. which is mind-blowing. Mm. I mean, the live one on Live at the Apollo is mind-blowing too for different reasons, but the original um, – you can hear it. His voice, it's yeah. like it's over-modulated yeah, when he's yeah. hitting the high notes yeah, and yet, yeah. fuck, it sounds yeah, amazing. It sounds amazing. That's what you're talking about, yeah, that's what about, I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, so a lot of people now would think that that would be the wrong thing to do. That's the weird thing. Oh, they probably it, would. Know? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, isn't it true too, Pete, that with digital, because it's all pluses and minuses, yeah. at one point it's got to cut off. That's right. But with analogue, I mean, I know we're only talking nanoseconds. Yeah. It actually never cuts off. And that's why it sounds so live. Yeah. It can only that's right. Li it, even a studio recording, doesn't it? It sounds yeah, live. That's right. A, a really good analog, play through analog gear. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, that's why I buy vinyl still. I yeah. mean, I still buy CD. I do everything. But, I mean, vinyl, it does have, it really does have it. I just bought the Teskey Brothers yeah, newish one on yeah, vinyl. Yeah, great. Yeah, for instance. Yes, no, they're doing yes. great work. And that was, yeah, and that, that's recorded, yeah. isn't it, on 24 track? Yeah, I think so. I'm not too sure how they recorded it. Is. About you, you know, their first album's called Half Mile Harvest. Yeah. You know why it's called that? Uh, is it because, has it got something to do with Neil Young? Or. It looks a little bit like yeah. that, and that, yeah. He, absolutely. Yeah. And even the cover is a. Is the cover art, yeah, it's, but it's called Half Mile Harvest because that's the amount of tape you use to record right. the album. Half mile. <laughs> Half mile of tape. Half mile of tape. They've got, have they got a Neve? I don't know anything about sound really. Yeah. A bit that. They got, is it Neve? They've yeah. got an unbelievable yeah. well, Neve board one, or something. Well, one, Neve was one of the most popular mixing consoles in the 70s, early 80s. Or maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. And then, but and then, they've and, got one of them. And but they've the, said, oh, they got twenty four track, two inch studio. Two inch studio. That would make sense. The, the two inch recorder. Table. I yeah. think it's that. Yeah. Yeah. Because they come from your area, don't they? Those boys. Do they come from around? No, they're from Warrandyte. They're aren't from they? Warrandyte. Well, the okay. studios in oh, Melbourne right. in Warrandyte. Okay. I thought. Okay. I thought they originated from around Port Ferry, somewhere around there. Warner no, Ball. best known yeah. museo around here would be Shane Howard from yeah. Goanna. Yeah. He lives about a k from here. Yeah. Um, Which, actually, Archie Roach lives in Kalani, a okay, cave from here also. Okay. You've got some really talented m musicians in your area. Actually, there are, this is a really interesting area, the Port Ferry region. It's a very – Port Ferry itself, very arty little town. I mean, it's only 2,500 people, and yet there's a real large number of, you know, painters, writers, mm. sculpture, photography, you know, every, yeah. mu musos, yeah. obviously. Yeah. There's a lot of – yeah, you're right. Yeah. A lot of, lot of, um, yeah, there are. I mean, probably what's the other really known? Mel, I mean, Warnables, which is only 30 k from Port Ferry, of course. Is Airborne come from, oh, Warn yeah. you know, Airborne? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You know them? I have, they're, I do they're, know um, them. Yeah, very, I mean, they're huge yeah. on the festival scene overseas, I think. And they're very loud. They're, they're literally from here. Um, yeah, they're very loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they played the Whalers Hotel yeah. in Lybrick Street about three years ago. Apparently some of the windows broke. Yeah, I could imagine. Something like that. Yeah, yeah it was yeah, I like can unbelievable. Imagine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, so. They're incredible. 
Uh, so, five so, million so, watts. So you moved bar. you moved to Tower Hill in the late nineteen eighties. Uh, what se- what was a series of events that led you to play and sing in Tumbling Dice and the Black Bouts? Well, that Carol died. My yeah. wife died. And that's really what you know. I did have a band in the eighties once. You know, where I I fluked it actually. I re- I recorded um, a cover of um, of, of I'm Bored. You yes. know, um, yeah. Iggy, Pop. Iggy Pop. Yeah. Yeah, and then Triple R played it a real lot. And because of that, we ended up doing a film clip. And everyone, because of my photography background, I kind of, I got, you know, a lot of people basically came and worked for it. Because it really was a film with pre video. It was like, <laughs> it shot in 16 mil yeah. film. And, um, and um, they cost a fortune in those days, you know, to make. In this case, it didn't because everyone worked for nothing and it was just the cost of the stock and the processing at Cinevex and that sort of stuff. But, and anyhow, that ended up on Rage, on Night Shift, on The Noise, on all the TV things. You know, this was my 15 minutes of fame. And then Carol got pregnant and I realised, oh, God, I better earn some money. Yeah. So, um, you know, I dropped all that. But yeah. then, you know, after she sadly died a few years ago, I thought, right, um, yeah. In fact, on my 62nd birthday, I sat up in bed. I said, I know what I want to do. I want to sing in a band. And I'm quite proud of what I've done. Yeah. I've got nothing then. There was no, I've got no studio. I didn't know anyone. Yeah. I couldn't sing. Yeah. la da Yeah. And I just thought, well, you know, it's uh, this thing, isn't it? You create your own reality in this world. So, yes. you know, if you, if, you, if you love something and you, you want to do it, then you do it. A bit like right. you with yeah. a sound production. That's you right. do it and, you know. You keep it's plotting what away. You, want to do. you keep That's you it. keep plotting away, and uh, whatever comes your way comes your way. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it. The main thing is to enjoy it. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, so, I'd lo- we'd love to play in Melbourne. Oh, God, I hope. You know, I, I, well, I want to play in Melbourne. I really do because I think both the bands are all right. Oh yeah, and, um, you'll have no problem it, getting it, a gig. But it's just a matter of who knows what the aftermath will be once we get through all of this. Will there be well, any yeah, places it's left? Isn't it, in the moment. Will there yeah, be any other? Will there be any gigs left? Well, you know. Yeah, well, we've got we've got one gig plugged in at the moment in November, <laughs> which we haven't cancelled. <laughs> Everything else has been cancelled. Yeah. But um, I mean, it's a yeah, state like of affairs because yeah, you've got to, you've got roll to, on the fifteenth of May, isn't that's, that it? That's when the, they're going to the make 11th, the next decision. The eleventh of May, yeah. Eleventh is it? It's the eleventh. Yeah, but, 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 but I can't imagine uh, they'll be giving the green light to live venues or sporting. Uh, no, although WA has just said you can have a meeting of ten people, haven't they? Yeah, right. Oh well, that's, I think ten people can get together. Yeah, oh well, that's good. That's a start. You know, it's a start. Trickle. That wouldn't be enough to pay for the band, though. No, 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 that's right. Ten <laughs> people, it? you know. <laughs> Not much on the door there. No, 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 no. no. But, um, yeah, I was just going to talk about um, your Iggy Pop song because um, oh, yeah. I was going through your YouTube channel and I noticed you had mm. done the Iggy uh, Pop on board it's, tribute in, believe it or not it's there still so, no, my so, son put it up there so, not me yeah so you know. so um you you met you, you spoke a little bit about it but can you elaborate a little bit more about what actually was the catalyst for you to do that mm. yeah well it was a good story too i mean i i i knew there was some friends of mine um who who had a band and actually, Ian Trelaw was originally in a band, a huge band. They were huge in the 80s in Melbourne called Rock Steady. I mean, they were, I think they were pulling in two grand a night or something wow. in the 80s. Yeah. Like playing huge, you know, really I don't know, in front of a thousand people or more. I don't yeah. know. But Rock Steady were a very successful covers band, like probably the original really successful one in Melbourne. And then. Unless I'm wrong, but anyhow, they Ian left and started his own band called I Swim, which was the original band. And then he got a gig at the what's it called, the Grain Store, wasn't that the Grain Store in um, in King Street yeah. in the city? Yeah, the name of that yeah. place. And I was there. I sh- I heard some history going on because it was then when they got the gig to support John Farnham when on his comeback. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, and and backstage, and I'd gone on because I was friends with them. I'm sorry, I've gone off the subject. You want to talk about on board, but anyhow, this is worth knowing. That's this. okay. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I'm back there, <laughs> like, and right in front of me, you know, I'd come on stage and said, "Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Grain Store. Here's I Swim." So they did their set, and then I'm standing the side of the in back of the stage there, and right in front of me is Glenn Wheatley and Molly Meldrum yeah. looking at this show, and I'm like two feet behind them, just standing there like this, and 
and and it, it was amazing. Like like Farnham's band, they played about three songs, and then um, Glenn Wheatley turned. I heard him say it. Turned to Molly Meldrum and said, "Well, Molly, what do you reckon I should do?" And Meldrum turned around and Wheatley and said. Sign him tonight. <laughs> so it was like I was there at that moment that <laughs> the decision was made. For Whispering Jack. Like, and, and then Whispering Jack yeah. came about yeah. and all that, you know. so A massive album. Yeah. It was colossal, it was wasn't it? Unbelievable. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, but roughly that era, I'd, I'd, yeah, anyhow, me and, and Ian's band used to record. And then I turned up at one of their sessions at five o'clock in the afternoon but i was aware the studio was booked till six and i've they were packing up i was sod that is an hour let's not waste it let me have a go yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> i want to i oh, know sung anything yeah i want to have a go at i'm bored yeah yeah you because know, i really like the song you yeah. know i'm bored i'm a chairman of the board i'm a lengthy monologue i'm living like a dog i mean they're yeah. brilliant lyrics so anyhow we we cut it and it wasn't half bad. It was eight track. I remember now, eight track. And uh, anyhow, um, yeah, and then it, it, I think I said before, the, the damn thing got played a lot. There's it's Triple a, it, R it in sounds those days great. demos it's, a lot. It sounds great. <laughs> you know, it really does. It sounds like Iggy Good Pop. It really does sound like Iggy Pop but in a different manner mm. but um yeah well that's good i mean i would never try to emulate anyone but then i do take my cues from these guys i mean you know for me actually iggy pop and mick jagger from a male vocalist point of view they're the two for me they're the totally and in fact with the black belts uh, the original version of the, and we may do this again in another form but you know we were doing a lot of other of his amazing songs like i want to be your dog and raw par and you know all those amazing. Yeah. I want to be your dog. I almost got chucked off stage here because he came on stage with that with his bloody great marrow bone. <laughs> three foot long. And then the guitar style. So I was sort of <laughs> pretending to eat the thing, you know, in God. front of them. They were appalled. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's show yeah. business, man. It's show business. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, you've got to sort of, do know. it. What, what did Oscar Wilde say? Well, was it Oscar Wilde? He said something like, there's only one thing worth um, – well, no, then, oh, now I'm going to screw this up. That's all right. Only one thing. Um, oh, can't remember it. That's all right. Sorry. Uh, uh, it's something like no, only, there's only one thing worse than not than, than being noticed. It's not being noticed. noticed. But it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. I, I just, yeah. just want to quickly get to this, this uh, the, the Port Melbourne, South Melbourne uh documentary that you made so you you made a documentary oh, you've seen that. yeah so, so you made a documentary in the mid 1980s detailing when the, the gentrification of south melbourne and port melbourne was occurring and the cult, was. and the cultural change was significant of these areas many mm. mainly of the close knit communities with uh with both areas south melbourne and port yeah, melbourne it was well ba- you know like port melbourne in the 80s even then you know it was it really was a village it was not like any i mean williamstown was, was a little bit like it but nowhere else in melbourne it was this very sort of insular small community though i mean i remember <clears throat> the hardware shop in bay street it was called earl's timber yard it was one of those amazing shots where you'd walk in and the you know the the floor the the floor it was just floorboards you know dust you know like no carpets floorboards you know like mm. the real old style and literally if you went in there and said look I'm look, if they, that shop sold everything so if you went in there and said look I want a bolt from a it's off the suspension on a 1927 Chevrolet they'd say oh no problem it's out the back yeah I mean they they had everything it yeah. was you know that sort of place you know and the community really was. It's like a village. And so when the station pier, huge development was suggested, there was a lot of, not surprising, a lot of concern. Yeah, and I made a, a little film about it that was pretty amateurish because it was virtually the first. I did shoot a lot of video later, by the way, you yeah. know, like did films about the folk festival in Port Ferry, went on air in Canada and stuff. But like the, that that was the beginning of it and and it was a it was an interesting thing to do because you know people did feel very and of course the, <laughs> it was all futile because of the unfortunately because the 
the development was built oh, in yeah. the end. Yeah. And, 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 you know, but, you know, that's, the, that's what's happened all the way around the world, including Melbourne. Yeah. I mean, Ligon Street in yeah. the 70s and the 80s was completely different. Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing the sports playing live just off like in, in a lane, just off Tiamo there, yeah. you know, in the 70s. It was amazing. They were playing on the back of a truck and it's on the front of this wall that was, had graffiti all over it. Yeah. And Steve Cummings and Martin Armanger, and they're just cranking out all this amazing. Yeah, I was probably, I would have seen your brother would have been there yeah. too, probably, you yeah. know. Yeah. That, that, that era was, you know, Ligon Street wasn't gentr. I mean, you know, there was no sports girl, there was no this or that. Yeah. It was all. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's progress, isn't yeah, that's it? It right. happens everywhere. That's right. <laughs> Such that's is life. Right. Such is life. So um, any new music projects coming up in the next year, especially with uh, the Covert 9 in the picture? Ah, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I've been mucking around. Actually, my son's doing something interesting. You know, my son James is 32 years old and he's, he's he, he his little company, Common Ventures, I'm not boasting, but he's, he won Best TV out of the year last year, his little company. It's only yeah. 15 people in it rather than – he's a co-owner and is like – he's up against all these advertising agencies like Ogilvy, Mather and <laughs> Clemengers with hundreds and hundreds of employees and multi-million dollar budget. And they, but anyhow, cut a long story short, he's been making this film. Um, <clears throat> it appears to be about me, funnily yeah. enough. I don't know why, but – well, I, I do know why, and yeah. it, it's just his idea, not mine. Yeah. Like I shot – 30 hours, no, no, I shot 100 hours of him growing up. Yeah. I even shot him being born, <laughs> but literally. And then, I mean, as it happens, but, you know, it was a camera. On but, um, yeah, 100 hours of footage. And, and, then, and then when Carol died, I shot 30 hours of footage of me, like talking about, because I thought I'll make a film about grief from a personal perspective. So I thought, oh. And so I, I just turned the camera around, but yeah, it was so harrowing. Unfortunately, in the end, I couldn't look at any of it. Yeah. So I, I just gave that thirty hours plus the other hundred hours to James and said, oh, "Maybe you want to check some of this out." So well, look, and he did. Yeah. And he started making this film that appears to be called Finding Richard at the moment because he says I, I know about twelve versions of my dad. Yeah. <laughs> so it's sort of. <laughs> so it's sort of about. Yeah, but the funny thing is it's sort of about him. Yeah, that's, that's what he's on about. It's, it's actually what interests him is what, what, what is the creative spirit? What is it that makes people want to write or want to paint or want to yeah. photograph or make music or yeah. make music like you do? That's yeah. a creative thing too. What is it that makes people want to do that? Mm. And it's, it, 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 you know, what is that? Yeah. And that's what he's on about in this. And it's probably the same with me because I do paint and, as well. And, you know, yeah. and, you know, la di da di da But, I mean, it's, it, it's a, anyhow. So what am I doing in relation to that and possibly a bit of music? Yeah. Like there's a Nick Lowe song called, uh, which he, he actually wrote for his father-in-law that was Johnny Cash at that time because yeah, right. he was married. Nick Lowe was married to Carleen Carter, I think. Right, okay. And it's called The Beast in Me. Okay. The beast in me yeah. is caged by frail and fragile bars. <laughs> and it's a really good song. Yeah. He, and Nick Lowe does it acoustic. It's a really good song. But the way I read it, it's the beast in me is kind of, it's about what is this beast that needs to be expressed, you know, mm. the creative thing. Yeah. So I might try and record that, for instance, and do, that's the sort of thing I could do when it's a bit shut down, maybe, mm. uh, you know. Uh, <clears throat> So, yeah, no, there's lots of stuff to be done. That's right. I mean, that's for sure, you know. Uh, uh, Bring it on. I said, onwards and upwards. That's my motto. That's right. Bring it on, man. That's right. Onwards and upwards. That's right. I'm, I'm uh, staying afloat in a leaky boat, but uh, I'm, I'm doing okay. <laughs> well, I hope it doesn't sink, Pete. No. It doesn't look like it is yet. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Oh well, 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 That's it. well, I want to. In a leaky boat. Who's, what's a what's that line from? Who's that? Is that crowded house? Yeah, that, no, is that that was split split ends? split ends? Yeah, they well, they they spent six years in a leaky boat. I'm staying afloat in a leaky boat. You are. That's yeah. staying afloat. Well, that's a nice segue here because if Phil Jones, who's the guitarist in both um, the Black Belts and um, Tumbling Dice. 
is the brother um, Peter Jones. of Peter Jones, yeah. who was in Crowded House yes. yeah. before he sadly died. He was the, one of the two drummers they had that died. Yeah. And oh, there we go. I mean, incredible And story. he lives up the road. Yeah. 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 That's qu- quite a, a, an amazing – well, not an amazing thing. It's a, quite a sad thing, isn't it, that two drummers out of uh, Crowded House have passed away. The it cur- happened in Spinal Tap, but it wasn't quite the same <laughs> there, know, was it? I know. <laughs> the, curse of, I mean, the curse of Crowded House. Yeah, no, House. it's tragic. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah, the first guy topped himself, of course. Yeah. yeah you know, like, he was rotten. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah absolutely. But, um, um, yeah, I mean, um, having said that, on a slightly lighter note, I did yeah. watch Sp- Spinal Tap again recently. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> funny <laughs> film. Yeah, have you seen it I, recently? I haven't, but I remember I was working at Woodstock Studios in the uh, mid to late nineties, <clears> and James Black said to me because I used to scratch my head about how some of the musicians were behaving, and he said, "Just watch Spinal Tap, and it'll make sense. Everything will make sense to you." So, so I went to the video store, I watched it, and I, and I couldn't believe it. I'm going, I actually know people who are like this <laughs> in real life. Yeah. And it was – What's even more incredible is that quite a few professional musicians, when that film came out, thought it was a documentary. <laughs> it's real. I know. I know. I mean, no. I mean mm. it was just shocking because I, I, I couldn't believe it. I'm going, now everything makes sense. And, and when I went back into the studio and I'd come across people like that or any craziness, uh, I could just go, yep, I know where that's coming from. You know, I could, I, can, I could relate it to something, which was it was like therapy for me, watching Spinal Tap. Yeah, yeah, no, I can imagine, yeah. Well, the rock industry has changed. It has. You know, I've come back to it again. I mean, honestly, as I said before, in the 60s, if you were in rock and roll, you were a delinquent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how you were perceived yeah. by everybody. Yeah, totally. You know, now it's a, a respected... Yes. You know, someone uh, dedicated follower of fashion. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's actually, you know, yeah. You're, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's really quite respected profession. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Missy Higgins went to Geelong Grammar. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, that's right. I mean, God, you know, yeah. and she's really good, isn't yeah. she, of course? Yes, but, that's yeah, right. So, anyhow. Yeah. C'est la vie. All right. Well, thank you, Richard. I want, C'est la vie. I, I want to, uh, I appreciate your time. Well, I've wasted enough of your bandwidth, so thanks. No, yeah. that's fine, mate. <laughs> um, I, like, again, I, I appreciate your time. It's been fantastic. Um, you know, and if Good you, fun. Yeah. Onwards and upwards. That's it. That's it, isn't it? All right. Yeah. yeah all right. Thank yeah. you, mate. I'll see you around. Bye. Cheers, Pete. Dead when voodoo strikes, it'll tear apart your head.